Hold on, mate. Thomas still felt that he could talk to Edwards and pressure him to tell the truth. Because Edwards confessed so easily after his arrest, Thomas had always thought him to be the weakest link in the case. And yet, even if Edwards did start talking now, would it be enough? Back in 1964, when Edwards and Seal were released from jail, nothing further had been done. The district attorney in 1964, Lennox Foreman, repeatedly stalled the case, apparently despite damning evidence, and he would never take the case forward to a grand jury or a trial. While they waited for another chance to contact Edwards, Ridgen and Moore decided to look up the grave of the other accused murderer, James Seal. And that's when they got the biggest surprise of all. James Seal wasn't dead. Like his co-conspirator Edwards, Seal was an army veteran. He had also been a truck driver, farmer, crop duster, and for a while, a cop in Louisiana. He and members of his family were much feared in the community with a well-deserved reputation for violence. I had been told by a prominent Mississippi journalist that James Seal had died some time ago. I'd also read the same in the LA Times and elsewhere. If James Ford Seal were dead, then this is the cemetery that he would be buried in, because this is the church that he attends. While there were Seal family members buried here, we found no James Seal. We had just arrived in Franklin County, and we decided to stop at a gas station in Roxy, Mississippi, for a snack. Mm. By chance, we met a man named Kenny Bird. The name is Kenny Bird. Kenny Bird. And Kenny would tell us the most shocking revelation of the trip so far. Well, he, he said he know where James Seal lived at. Right there. Right here. <laughs> It was a stunning discovery that we knew would change the course of the Dean Moore case. Yeah. Where's James Seal there? Right there? Right there. <laughs> Let me get out and get a shot of him. I wanted that that song would be. It looked like it. Yep. Yep. James Seal is still alive. I'd be damned. Seal was indeed alive one of the ringleaders of the Dean Moore killing. Now two of the conspirators in the case were known to be living, Edwards and Seal. The embarrassingly easy discovery of James Seal re-energized the case and started an avalanche of press that culminated with this New York Times article. The myth of Seal's death had been perpetuated by family members who told the media that he was dead. The story was believed and reported as true. Thomas Moore was anxious to break through the guilt of his 40 year silence and wanted to confront James Seal, one of the alleged clan killers of his brother. But fearing Seal might have a gun at the ready, Thomas decided to surprise him from a safe distance. Hey, sir! Hey, sir! I'm, I'm calling for James Ford Seal. My name is Thomas James Moore. I'm the brother of Charles Eddie Moore. Some of a bitch ran inside, a whole bunch of, all of them. They ran inside. Why don't you come out and be a man? All I want to do is talk to you, punk. I hope to see you in court. <laughs> I confront him, he ran in his trailer. I'm not gonna kill this tired ass, he ain't worth it. It was at this point that more detailed plans to confront James Seal and Charles Edwards began to crystallize in Thomas's mind. He'd proceed along several tracks, try to continue approaching Edwards, the weak link in the case, to get him to confess, and simultaneously apply pressure on Seal, whom Thomas felt was more dangerous by using other tactics. And finally, while confronting these men could lead to something important, Thomas knew he'd need some higher-powered allies to close the deal. We made an appointment to see the federal U.S. attorney. Would he be the one to give Thomas Moore some hope? Is it on? Could you 
Turn it on. <laughs> Lampton was appointed by George W. Bush on September 7, 2001, and he'd never heard about the Dean Moore case until I'd contacted him the week before. So we were in the same unit. Yeah. It's, it's a small world. It's a small world. As it turns out, Lampton and Thomas served in the same Army Division at the same time, though they did not know each other. Lampton a colonel, and Thomas a command sergeant major. The decision that, and that there was not sufficient evidence to prove it happened on federal land was made before I got here. And what we've got to understand, oh, yeah. Yeah. the Klan was a terrorist organization back in the 60s. Right. And they, they had a lot of power because people were afraid of them, right. and people are not afraid of them anymore. We're going to take a real careful look at this for you, okay? At least I can do for old my sergeant. old sergeant major. Okay. Old sergeant never die. All right, is that enough? That's good news. All right. So he said he's going to take a personal interest in it, say he owed that to his sergeant major. After that, a federal attorney started looking into the case and reviewing the old evidence. But Thomas Moore still had one thing he wanted to do. He wanted to confront Charles Marcus Edwards and hand him a copy of the FBI report. So Ridgen and Moore decided to surprise him outside his church. <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Edwards, I have something for you, sir. What is it? There's something that I think you want to read. No, 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 no. Take it on back. No, no, sir. I want you to read it because, well, I want to ask you why your name in no FBI report, sir. Huh? Why is your name in no FBI report? I'm not on the FBI report. That's what you have in your hand, sir. No. I'm not, uh, uh, all I want to do is What's talk with you. What's your name, sir? My name is Moore. Thomas James Moore. I did, I'm going to tell you, sir. I did not kill you, sir. I didn't have, I didn't have anything to do. Well, sir, all I want to ask you, why is your name and James Ford seal in the document? Well, the FBI, the That's FBI all I dropped ask. all this case, and you know that. Well, I know, I know from the FBI file, sir, that he was never. They dropped the case because there wasn't any evidence, and I didn't have anything. I've never been on that Mississippi River in my life. I've sir, did you have anything? Did you have anything to do with picking those boys up, though, sir? Down the report Mito? said that you and James Ford seal picked them up. It did not say you killed them. Did you have anything to do with that, sir? Picking those boys up? I haven't got any I haven't got anything. Y'all get off this church ground and quit stirring up the you know, church. Did you have anything to do with picking those boys up, sir? Over there. Time to go. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel now? I feel great. I feel great. I feel great. I mean, I did what I had to do. And, I mean, he, he made me ask some questions. All I want to know is why your name is in the FBI document. It was clear that Edwards had never known about the FBI's evidence against he and Seal. Thomas felt that as a result of the confrontation on the church steps, Edwards would now be more vulnerable to any approach by authorities. <laughs> After confronting Charles Edwards, Thomas got on the phone to U.S. Attorney Dunn Lampton to tell him about what had just happened at the church. Okay, what happened? I gave him some documents, and he's very, very, very nervous about it. I think he's ready to go, and I think, I think you, I know you're a busy man, but I think you should rush on down there and talk to him. But that's why I need to know what you're giving him. Okay, I'll get that to, I'll, I'll get that to you in the mail okay. today or tomorrow. The plan worked. Edwards read the report and decided to talk to the federal attorney's office. A grand jury was convened to look into the case, and not long after, U.S. Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez made the big announcement. We are announcing today that James Ford Seal has been indicted by a federal grand jury for two counts of kidnapping resulting in death for his participation in the abductions and murder of two 19-year-old African-American men in 1964, Henry D. and Charles Moore. Public and governmental interests in the murders of Moore and D. have been renewed by the activism of the brother of one of the victims. That brother, Thomas Moore, is here with us today.
The trial of James Ford Seal is tentatively set for April 2007. Charles Edwards was not indicted, and sources close to the case say that he is cooperating with authorities. And that's News in Review. I'm Carla Robinson. Thanks for watching. of woman right now is not of a woman but more of a young very thin girl and that's the definition of beauty and you do see more and more girls who um, have eating disorders on news and review today fashion and the dangerously thin hello I'm Carla Robinson by now most of us know what we have to do if we want to live healthy and hopefully long lives we have to keep active and exercise. We have to avoid harmful habits like smoking. And of course, we have to eat a balanced diet of the right kind of foods. The problem is, too many of us don't. A recent study of the eating habits of Canadians showed that we're eating too many of the wrong foods. The study asked more than 35,000 Canadians what they had eaten in the last 24 hours. It was the first national survey of our eating habits since the early 70s, and it showed many of us aren't eating a balanced diet. Some examples, most people don't eat the minimum five servings of fruit and vegetables daily. People in their 30s and 40s have the highest fat intake. More than a quarter get 35% of their calories from fat. And dairy intake is too low, especially in seniors and children. Heat calcium in the bones has to be before the teens. And if they're not getting that, then we definitely know they're going to go possibly go into adulthood for risk for osteoporosis. It's to stay on the bike and have fun. In a spinning and class, instructor okay. Valerie Afriat motivates her young charges, among them her 13-year-old daughter, Ariel. This is a program designed especially for kids with weight issues. It teaches them the value of healthy eating habits and regular exercise. We think mostly of the things you see on TV, heart disease and stuff like that, and it just doesn't look like much fun. She's on the right track. After studying the issue for five months, a House of Commons Health Committee says child obesity has become an epidemic in Canada, outranking smoking and drinking in health care costs. For Ariel's mother, Valerie, it's a big concern. My fear is that she's going to carry this into her adulthood without learning the right healthy habits. The report contains some troubling statistics that one in four of Canadians between the ages of 2 and 17 is overweight or obese. Among Native people on reserves, the number is more than half at 55%. In one of the more startling observations, committee members point to a worrisome trend that today's generation of kids may live less healthy and possibly shorter lives than their parents. Dr. Colin McMillan is the president of the Canadian Medical Association. He's the physician who raised that concern during the hearings. If this obesity problem, which seems so large, continues, and goes on, then we'll have a group of children going into adulthood who are our future, who have a very high risk of these disorders, particularly diabetes, and will be less healthy and live less long than their parents did. Diseases normally seen in adults now showing up in kids. Heart disease, okay. so just keep you know, talking. already in children we're seeing, you know, the artery is not dilating or expanding properly and cancer. The committee report recommends setting a goal of a halt to the rise of childhood obesity by 2010. It proposes mandatory and simple package labeling on food for children and a limit on trans fat content in food. I think the more alarming thing is that it's it's only now starting to resonate with policymakers. It's more alarming uh, frankly that uh, we haven't done anything uh, uh, from a policy perspective yet. Ariel says she actually likes exercising and hopes that sweating it out here today will pay off later on when she becomes an adult. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. But if eating too much is bad for you, so is not eating enough. 
it can also kill you. Doctors say they are treating more and more Canadians for eating disorders, especially young women and girls. And some experts are pointing the finger directly at the fashion industry for its use of super thin models. Models who starve themselves to try to live up to a dangerous and sometimes deadly body image. And now it seems that some members of the global fashion industry are finally getting the message. The CBC's Maureen Taylor explains. In her photo spreads, Toronto model Natasha DeRyder is, by most standards, sexy. But in the world of haute couture, sexy has been replaced by skinny. On the international catwalks, DeRyder has been told her 36-inch hips are considered too considerable. It's just a difficult because everything is weighted on how you look and you're not working if you're not looking a certain way. So the pressure is really, really, um, it's, a, it's a lot to deal with. That's it. The model, she's 14 years old. Right now, crack me. Monica Schnarr right, became Canada's it. most famous supermodel when she won the Ford Supermodel of the World contest in 1986, the youngest girl ever to win that title. Today, at 35, Schnarr looks back and feels lucky to have modeled at a time when models didn't have to be rake thin. Well, I started, um, I think, during a very healthy time when Cindy Crawford was modeling and Frederick Van der Waal and very curvy women. I think it was probably a size eight because I was modeling and, you know, I wasn't a rail. Um, mind you, when I started, I was 14, so I was thinner. I am concerned, you know, for young girls and body image and, I mean, that's why I wanted to do this interview to to really impress upon girls to be healthy is much more important and trust me I've been there I've been on the cover of Vogue and it might be every girl's dream and I've been in Sports Illustrated but at the end of the day my health it is the most important thing so models were definitely bigger then oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> what would this have been what